The White House is pushing back against House Democrats who are investigating Russian election meddling and attempts by the president to stop the Mueller investigation. Democrats are calling for more documents and testimony related to the special counsel's probe. But President Trump says his administration has already provided plenty of documents and testimony. Mr. Trump says Mueller's probe probe proved he did nothing wrong. CBS News's Natalie Brand reports on the ongoing battle between the White House and Capitol Hill. President Trump is pushing back against Democratic-led investigations in Congress, saying he's already cooperated with special counsel Robert Mueller. No collusion, no obstruction. It was a total hoax. And yet I was transparent. We gave 1.4 million documents. We gave hundreds of people. The president does not want former White House counsel Don McGahn to comply with a subpoena to testify and turn over documents. I let him interview the lawyer, the White House lawyer, for 30 hours. Think of that, 30 hours. So far, the president has not tried to stop special counsel Robert Mueller from testifying on the Hill, and lawmakers are working to schedule an appearance. Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham wrote a letter to Mueller Friday offering to let him testify before his committee, while the House Judiciary Committee has already been trying to schedule an appearance. The House is also seeking the unredacted Mueller report from the Department of Justice. If we don't get that, we will proceed to hold the Attorney General in contempt and we'll go from there. House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler has given the DOJ a 9 a.m. Monday deadline to comply. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. All right, so let's bring in Joel Payne and Michael Graham. Joel is a Democratic strategist, former Hillary for America senior aide, and a vice president at MWWPR. He's in Washington, and Michael is a CBSN political contributor. He's a conservative columnist for the Boston Herald and a politics editor at Inside Sources. He joins us from Boston. Good to have you both with us. Uh, Happy to be here. Um, Joel, Joel, let's start with you. How much longer should Democrats focus on the issue of getting the unredacted version of the Mueller report and the underlying evidence. Is there a point um, where they are at risk of losing momentum on, on other issues because of this? Well, so I think actually this is the strategy for Democrats now, right? It's, you know, you don't want to talk about impeachment. You want to talk about investigation. And you want to talk about full transparency. So what Democrats are going to do is they are going to demand the unredacted version of the report. They are going to ask for Bob Mueller to testify. They're going to ask for Dom again to testify. This is essentially, I think Michael coined the phrase, uh, Michael, I think this was you, uh, kind of a two-step impeachment, right? Not not just a straight up and down, right. you know, attempt for impeachment, but a phased version of impeachment. And I think Democrats feel like this is safer ground for them to operate on. And, and Michael, we know the Trump campaign is trying to make the topic of investigations front and center uh, in 2020. Right. Do you see that as a winning issue for them? Well, you know, Trump is stuck with the legacy of the Mueller investigation and the two years of the conversation. So this is a thing. And so dealing with it by calling it unfair, energizing your own base makes some sense. And, you know, the new Harvard uh, poll out today finds that 58 percent of Americans say time to move on. And I think something that the, in, the, in the impeachment two-step, when Nancy Pelosi says impeachment's too good for him, uh, which was just a great line, what she's really saying is, oh, I saw the new poll that shows 60 Eight, I think, percent of Americans say don't impeach Donald Trump. So Democrat, the more Democrats talk about how you can't trust him, that's a win for them. The more they look like they're going to seriously try to impeach him and spend a lot of time and energy on that, I think a lot of, of the, the persuadable Americans are not that interested. Joel, more than a dozen Democratic presidential hopefuls have called for, for Barr to resign. Do you see this as a political risk for Democrats and calling for the attorney general to step down? Is this a waste of time? Should they be using their energy elsewhere? Well, you could say they should be using their energy elsewhere in terms of <laughs> trying to win over votes. But if they want to talk about Donald Trump and trustworthiness and the, in the issue of impeachment, again, this is the safer ground for them to be on. Go after the people around Trump. Go after the things around Trump. Don't go after Trump himself. I don't know if voters in middle America care if they call on Bob, Bill Barr to resign or they, you know, for heaven's sakes, even try to right. impeach Bill Barr. I think that's a safe place for Democrats to operate on, and there's less kickback and less blowback than, say, going after Donald Trump. The Trump campaign sent an email to supporters earlier this week 
calling on them to stand with the attorney general. It also read, quote, uh, patriotic Americans can't sit by and watch Democrats attack Barr for doing his job. Michael, do you see this as becoming part of the campaign's long term strategy? Well, once again, I think they're stuck with it. But I, there's an upside for Democrats that, that uh, Joel didn't mention, which, which is here we are talking about Bill Barr and, you know, what can the Congress do, by the way, and what are we not talking about? The lowest unemployment since 1969, 3.2% GDP growth. The fact that uh, uh, Mexico is now complaining that the House is stopping this new trade deal, the renegotiated uh, NAFTA, which whether you like it or not, it's something that Trump promised to do. He's trying to take credit for. So the, the danger for the team Trump is that this sucks the oxygen out of the things that they could be talking about. Of course, one reason it does is when you t put a microphone in front of Donald Trump, he doesn't talk that much about the economy. <laughs> he wants to relitigate the, the 2016 election again. And switch. Michael, I'm happy to talk about the Donald Trump. Exactly. The Barack, the Barack Obama economic boom. I'm happy to talk about <laughs> <laughs> We're going to switch topics. The president has been weighing in on his potential challengers. Earlier this week, he retweeted nearly 60 people voicing criticism about Vice President Joe Biden, former Vice President Joe Biden. Michael, um, is it too early for him to be engaging in the, in the Democratic primary? Or you think he's, he's well, right I mean, on? If you're if you're asking about strategy, then you have a good point. But we're not talking about strategy. We're talking about Trump. And Trump is going to talk about what people are talking about. And once again, that same uh, Harris, uh, Har Harvard Harris poll, I think, showed uh, uh, Vice President Biden with a 30 point lead over his next closest Democratic challenger. And so Trump's going to talk about him. I don't, it doesn't, whoever pops up, he's going to shoot. I think what's driving Trump crazy is that he's not the center of the attention mm -hmm. about the election. And so I, I think if he could, he would file as a Democrat to become the 20, what would that be, 24th Democrat in the race so that he could be part. Part of that conversation too. And, and Joel Biden already seems to be running his campaign as if he is the nominee. A recent CNN poll found him to be leading in the Democratic field. Um, help us assess the campaign strategy here after the first week. Oh, it's very clear. They're running an over the top incumbency campaign, essentially a whistle stop campaign with Joe Biden running for the third term of the Obama Biden presidency. Um, and look, it may work in droves, it may work in short spurts. Um, you know, I don't think, based on my conversation, based on what I know about this Democratic Party electorate right now, I don't think right. that they want to be handed a candidate on a silver platter. I think they want someone to earn it. They want the underdog. They want someone who's going to fight for their vote. You know, I was having a conversation with some folks on Capitol Hill, and what they were telling me is that Biden's actually got endorsements and support and, and, and a whole pipeline of what I would call conventional metrics of success lined up. They just don't actually want to roll it out in this first week of 10 days. They want to slowly drip it out because they know they'll overwhelm the electorate if they do it too early and too aggressively. But, Joel, help us kind of square those two ideas. You were talking about folks wanting an underdog, Joe Biden certainly not being that person. How, why are his, his, his poll numbers so strong then when you look at the people behind him? This is going to sound strange on a political show. Don't pay attention <laughs> to the poll numbers right now. These are these, this is, these are these are snapshot of sentiment. And and listen, Joe Biden is the most well-known person in this field, and he's running now. And there was certainly a burst of energy that came with his launch. So did Kamala Harris when she ran. So did Elizabeth Warren when she announced. So did Pete Buttigieg about a month ago. This is going to be you know the Ferris wheel primary because everyone's going to be up. And going to be down at a certain point. Now, will Joe Biden get as low as, you know, in the single percentages? I don't know, but I doubt what we're looking at today in terms of the lineup of support, you know, 38 for Biden, 15 for Bernie, so on and so forth. I doubt we're going to be staring at that type of appeal this time next year. Just history does not pan that out. Joel, I know you love right. uh, polls so much, so I want to bring up another one. A new Quinni Quinnipiac poll found 56 percent of Democrats felt Biden had the best chance of winning. Um, but is there a concern among Democrats that electability may not translate to, to, to being the candidate who can actually beat President Trump? Yeah, there's an active discussion also about what electability means. You know, I've actually yeah. seen some polls that also demonstrate that age is a big barrier for not only uh, Joe Biden, but Bernie Sanders, and for that matter, Donald mm -hmm. Trump, which would actually give credence to someone like Pete Buttigieg, who's talked a lot about generational change. There are a lot of things that all of these candidates are going to have to contest with. Right now, people like the idea of Joe Biden. It feels like he has the best chance to beat Donald Trump. But we've got dozens of debates. we got a dozen plus debates. We've got 
25 candidates, apparently. We've got a lot of steps in this process to get through, see who comes out. And, and, and to that point, Michael, two candidates from your part of the country up in New England, Senator right. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, are actually using this argument against Biden. How do you see this playing out? So here's the danger of running an electability uh, candidacy as those great presidents, John McCain, Mitt Romney, and Hillary Clinton demonstrated. Uh, it's basically playing political Jenga. The people who support Sanders, for example, or the people who support Warren, for example, they support the candidates. And so if the candidate's up or down, well, hey, they are in. But if you're voting for somebody strategically, I'm voting for you because you can win. And then you have a Jenga block that falls and the tower starts to shake. They're not going to stick. They're going to look like, oh, okay, you're not the one who can win. Who else can? Right. And that is the, the fundamental danger here. I have not, uh, traveling across New Hampshire, talked to a ton of Democrats. I'm fascinated by watching the race develop. I've yet to talk to a single person who wants Joe Biden to be president. They just want Joe Biden to beat Donald Trump. And that's a precarious place to be as a candidate. Well, uh, we will end with the same question for both of you. As right. you look at the 2020 field, who is having a big week and who is having a bad week? Joel, we will start with you. Big week goes to Joe Biden. Um, all my points that I just made aside, listen, he's had a fantastic launch. And most notably, we've seen that the surge in his polling numbers has come primarily from African-American voters, which I've been talking a lot about, particularly African-American women being a key indicator. You're not going to win a Democratic primary this go around without African-Americans and African-American women behind. The bad week goes to Pete Buttigieg, the other side of that coin. Buttigieg has gotten a lot of bad press for some of his actions when he was the mayor of South Bend. There's been a lot of talk about him not exactly um, promoting the most diverse agenda. And he had a pretty ham-handed photo op with Al Sharpton in Harlem um, a week ago, which did not necessarily go over well. Right. And, and Michael, what about you? Well, first, I just want to say, as a guy who grew up in South Carolina, I've never asked anyone for the right way to eat fried chicken. I eat fried chicken with my hands like <laughs> God intended, and I don't apologize for it at all. The big week is Elizabeth Warren, simply just by not going backwards for a change, and she had some nice pull bumps, and that's nice. I think, and I know Joel's going to agree, the bad week was Biden because he's already shown a couple of, let's call them fuzzy moments, saying China's not a problem, for example, and, and stumbling on some questions. And when it's electability that's the key, if you look like maybe you're not ready for the big fight, people are going to bail. And Joe Biden needs to really tighten his game up. He cannot afford an early gaffe. All right, Joel Payne and Michael Graham, great to see you both and have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you.